Cole Burschbach, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm great, Melissa. How are you? I'm fantastic. Excellent. This is going to be fun. I'm really glad we have this opportunity to chat. Uh, tell us where you're coming from today. I live in the great state of Wisconsin. I've been in the Midwest my whole life. And yeah, here with my husband and three kiddos. Yeah, Awesome. I am in central Illinois, so we're both on the same time zone. And uh, I don't often get to speak with someone who lives, quote unquote, so close. I know, right? <laughs> the world has gotten much uh, different in perspective and skill. Yeah, absolutely. Cole, tell us a little bit about what you do. So I have a few little tricks up my sleeve. I work as both a yoga instructor and a coach. And these have been a really beautiful pairing for me because one of my deepest held beliefs is that like we have to start with the body. And so getting to teach yoga and Pilates is a beautiful way to get people in their bodies. But then the work beyond that for me really resides in the family. Um, I, I really believe that when somebody is willing to do the internal work themselves, that something completely different becomes available for them. But then when a group of people are doing that together, something really magical can unfold. It ends up being almost like an exponential growth rather than like a one plus one plus one situation. So um, that's really the work I aim to support is, yes, the individual work of moms and dads and people who really want to show up in their families, um, but then how that kind of spills over into the whole family life and family dynamic. You know, and there's a lot of evidence, uh, both anecdotal and empirical, that would support what you do. Mother Teresa liked to say, how do you change the world? You go home and love your family. I know. It's one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> yeah. And I do a lot of uh, family emotional systems work, emotional intelligence work, building on Murray Bowen's original work in the 60s and 70s, and the Enneagram, and all of those things are born out of those earliest relationships we have in our families. Mm -hmm. So there's so much that molds us and shapes us in that space. And if we can love the people we know the most and who know us the most and know how to push our buttons. Yeah. <laughs> we should probably do that outside yeah. of our people. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So how did you get to this point? What's what's the backstory, Cole? <laughs> you know, there's it's been kind of a windy road, honestly, to this point. What I knew from the beginning was that I had a really strong interest in health and wellness. I was an athlete in high school. I knew even as like a freshman or a sophomore in high school that I wanted to be a dietitian. And uh, early in my college experience, I was already studying nutrition and exercise science. But, um, you know, one of the most significant life events that I've experienced was I was hit by a drunk driver and had a whole bunch of injuries and surgeries and missed a semester of school. And, you know, whole, it felt like my life had exploded. Um, but it turned out to be one of the most like important gifts that I've ever received to really be able to have a hard experience that showed me that I needed to start doing the work and to be able to start doing that as a 19 year old rather than a 40, 50, 60 year old honestly has been one of the most important things that has ever happened to me. Um, but then I, ha I had a family young. I, my husband and I wanted to have kids right away. My first son was born when I was 24 and I had always wanted to be a mother. And I became a mother and it felt so, so, so different than I was expecting. And I felt like every day I not failed, but I just never felt like I was my best in that. And that was heartbreaking to me because family was the most important thing. And so I spent several years working in uh, a as a dietitian in a hospital and then stayed home for a few years to raise my babies and was getting to a point where I was ready to get back into working and again, supporting health and wellness. And I just 
didn't think I could go back to disease management. Not that that's not super important work. It just wasn't where my heart was. And because of just the nature of having a young family and having this interest and having the interest in doing the work myself, my brother and I were having this back and forth conversation of, okay, this is all awesome. Like we want to do this work. We want to be healthy. We want to work out. We want to do all these things, but not at the expense of our family. We want to do them in collaboration and with, with the family being the thing that's going to thrive the most by us doing this. And so that's, you know, kind of a long and windy path that led us to this place where we started doing coaching work and, you know, giving these uh, resources from people beyond ourselves, from, you know, therapists and occupational therapists and school teachers and other people that can help support a family unfolding in a really organic, <laughs> thriving way, uh, rather than doing the work at the expense, like as if the family's the obstacle. So it's been a windy path. That's how we got here. <laughs> and and it's beautiful work you do. Thanks. So thank you for that. Yeah, we love it. You know, you just, oh, yeah, I got hit by a drunk driver. And then I went and did this <laughs> and did that. And well, what did she really say? That? Did yeah. you, you got hit by a drunk driver at 19? Yes. Yeah, I, you know, it was really interesting because I was hit head on at highway speed. I really had absolutely no business even surviving that accident. But that was actually where the spark of something really powerful came from because I was clear that something else must have been at play for me to live and survive through that. Like there had to be a greater purpose. And so, I mean, I'm not going to say it was an easy road to recovery. My, my body took years to recover from that experience. And there's, you know, still times that that is present for me that, you know, there's my body is different than it was before that. Um, and, but it really took the hardest part of the work was digging into the internal experience of how do I let that go? How do I start to have more forgiveness and more love? How do I start to connect to a deeper meaning and purpose in my life? Because otherwise, what am I here for? I could have easily been gone that day, right? And so, I mean, it, I, I, I'm more aware of that now than ever that I can kind of like breeze past that as an experience. But part, the most important part of healing from that for me is to hold it a little bit more loosely rather than as something that's so mine and it's so my suffering and it was my thing to get through. And having a lighter touch with it has been a, a really important part of moving through it and past it and becoming stronger and better for having experienced it. I think forgiveness work is an often overlooked superpower. Mm. Most significant transformation can come from that work of forgiveness. That's a belief that, that I hold very closely. And the fact that you were able to do that and, and an event that has come to you in many ways, shape, and I don't want to say define. I think you define your own life and purpose, yes. but it had a powerful impact on it. Can you talk a little bit about what it took to do that forgiveness work? Yeah. So, I mean, there were a few things that happened right out of the gate that um, like started it organically without me having to necessarily think about it. Number one, I had a pretty strong faith before that happened. And I just, I never believed that the intention was for me to somehow hold this other person as my enemy. Like that just did not feel like the right path to even start down. Um, but the person who hit me died in the accident. And I just did not think that it, that I could hold a grudge or hold somebody so deeply at fault um, when they weren't even there. That it just, it felt really far away to do that. And then, I mean, this was one of the hardest things I've ever experienced, but in the hospital, um, the person who hit me was a divorced person, but he had four young children. And they, along with his ex-wife and mother, came to my bedside and apologized to me for what had happened. Wow. And how could I not Please. say, 
I was such brave people. And you know what? It was, I've often like wondered, like, how can I find them? How can I <laughs> connect with them and let them know, like, all is well? How do I, you know, repay you for giving me that gift that you gave when I was, you know, really in a hard place in a hospital bed? Um, but something about that was such a important gift for them to give me that I just, it, it almost like, overflowed like I I can't you said I'm sorry and I accepted that and so if I'm not going to accept that then I'm going to hold it and I'm going to keep it but if if I do accept it then I truly accept it um and so that started and then I think one of the most important things that happened as I continued down that path of healing and forgiveness was that at some point I realized that I am an imperfect person as well. Not that I, <laughs> that it wasn't the first time I had realized that. But the realization finally came to me that if I am able to stand with myself and say, I love myself as I am, then what I have to say to the spirit of that person is that I love you too. In your imperfection, I still have love for you. It's almost hard to like get that out with getting emotional because it's that was hard to come to a place where what I had to say to really kind of a almost like a figment in my imagination. I don't know what this person looked like. I have a name and, you know, a car he was driving like that's kind of the context of uh, what I had. But to say to kind of like this figment figment in my mind, like, I love you because if I'm going to try to love myself. I have to love all parts and I have to love all parts of you and all parts of the person next to me and all parts of my children, right? Like it can't be so select. And that, that experience of in my mind's eye giving love to that person, that was the biggest game changer of all that. And that only happened, you know, this accident happened like 21 years ago, but this experience that I'm sharing now, that just happened in the last 10 years. So it had a long arc <laughs> of, you know, walking the path along the way. Well, if what you're talking about is the absolute core of the human experience, the goal of spirituality, the goal of being human, the goal of living and moving in this world is what you just described, mm -hmm. that standing that full self-awareness of I stand here flawed and imperfect and beautiful the way I am. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I honor the same in you. Right. Is there a higher spiritual principle? For me, yes. <laughs> I, that is the highest, right? Like that I can, I can see, because to me, the only like, nuance above that is to honor that that's a gift from God. That that I, in my humanness, if I can't connect to spirit, probably I'm never going to get to a place where that's available. So to me, it's like a tiny layer that, you know, something more than that. Um, but yeah, that's why it took a whole bunch of work and a lot of soul searching and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> many, many years of being willing to be super uncomfortable with it to get to a, a different place. So how do you help people that come to you? Where do you start? So as I mentioned kind of in the beginning, for me, it all starts with the body because one thing that is really present for me in pretty much every person that I work with is that, it, and it, it, this isn't down to the individual experience. This is like more of a collective experience that then we all are kind of sharing in which is that for the vast majority of us, we have become like brains on a stick body. We've lost connectivity with our body. We've lost um, the signaling of what our body's trying to share and tell us. And so much of our intelligence and the, the wholeness of who we are is in the system. It's not only in the brain. So for the vast majority of people I start with, what are you doing to take care of your body? What does that look like for sleep, nutrition, exercise? Um, posture. I mean, really getting serious about like, what is the body trying to share with you so that you can start to take advantage of living in a, 
a more fully aligned and integrated system because lots of cool stuff starts to emerge from there, right? You can, that's where the signals of, I want something different, or I might recognize a little bit of change in my purpose or a value that I really want to commit more to in my life. So for me, it all starts by getting reintegrated into the body. And for a lot of people, that becomes the place where then the work takes lots of different turns because as the system integrates, there's kind of, it's not like a clear, like highway kind of path, but there's all of a sudden these kind of markers that people can start to walk toward that feel very much their own. Something I'm really uh, (laughs) committed to, I say this all the time, I'm like, make things as weird as possible. If it's true to you, who cares how weird it feels or looks or, you know, the neighbors might think whatever, who cares? If you can start to walk on those trail markers that are actually yours, you're going in the right direction. So after the body and after a little bit of mindset, focus, training, that's usually it starts to kind of, you know, become more person to person specific. But most of the people I work with have young families. So how do they do that work? When little kids are running around and the schedule is filled to the brim and all those things. So there's, you know, kind of that lifestyle management and then the connection and engagement piece with your spouse and children and, you know, most important family members. That also is a important part of what's under the umbrella of the work that we do. Yeah, and I think I love the wisdom that it's a holistic view because I have this core belief that if it is of what I who I call God, if it is of holiness, if it is of universal love and source, then it's not going to undermine those most important other sources in our lives that build us up. Right. So um, when you talk about with the family, for the purpose of the family, for the love of the family and the health of the family, that really got my attention. Mm. So it's not fighting against that busy schedule, but it's using all of it for the benefit of everyone, if I'm understanding you. Yes. Correctly. Yes, exactly. You know, one of my one of my really closely held beliefs is that we are given the circumstances that we are for a purpose. If we chose family, there's going to be things that unfold in that family unit that are designed for you. And something like a busy schedule, for instance, is that something that kind of like culturally and societal is happening for sure. But what is that trying to tell us on a grander scale, right? And how do I go into that knowing that being in that is going to teach me something. And I'm going to start to get to make choices about whether or not that's awesome for us and the very best of us is unfolding in kind of a fast paced, lots going on kind of environment, because for some people that will be true. Or is there something in that that I'm experiencing resistance every single day and I don't want to go to carpool or I don't want to go to the practice or whatever it is, And that's actually the information that we need to start to unpack whatever it is for us in the family unit. So, you know, I I think it's really easy to say, well, I want something different than that. Okay, well, it's there and you have it. (laughs) So how would you like to hold it and experience it and kind of peel back the layers on it in a way that actually help you rather than just this thing that you're kind of like grinding against all the time? Because that's I get it. We get in kind of that hamster wheel of like, we're just doing it. But if we can just take like the one slightest step back, then we get to start to decide how do we want to show up in that, engage with it? Do we like it? Do we not? Do we need to say no? Do we need to uh, have a family discussion about what does it look like on these busy nights for us? Like there's so many things that can happen if we're just willing to kind of, you know, pull back a, a dot from it and see it for what it is and then and then engage with it in a more meaningful and intentional way. And what if somebody in the family loves and it thrives on that, but someone else says, no, I need to just be quiet. I need to yeah. not do that. How do you handle that? Listen, I live in one of those families, so I have a lot of firsthand experience <laughs> with that. My husband is a goer and a doer and like he feels his fullest and happiest when he is on the move. 
And for me, I love that to an extent, but I definitely need like the retreat time and the restoration time or I'll feel exhausted quickly. And I think one of the first steps is to just have an open conversation about it, right? Because if he sees my perspective and he knows that I'm seeing his perspective, it's very easy for him to say, hey, it seems like maybe you need a few minutes. Like I got the dishes tonight. Or if I see him kind of like twiddling his fingers on the side and I know that what he wants is to kind of like move or take action. Hey, we have a quiet hour. That feels kind of good for us. You want to go hit some golf balls? Do you want to go out for a bike ride? Like, is there something that you, you know, like give the space for both of those things to happen. But I think where we get kind of tripped up is where the communication around those needs and interests kind of collapses and we make assumptions about what our partner or other people in our family want or need. And if we can just bring that back into conversation and be willing to just say, I see you here and here's how I would really like to be seen. um, Then we have a whole new chance to decide instead of just like try to rub against each other and and (laughs) have that friction point all the time. And I live with introverts. I am an introvert. And I remember one particular evening, and this was still when it was getting dark pretty early. So it's easy to just retreat yes. into our individual <laughs> cocoons. But I'm looking around. It wasn't even seven o'clock yet. And, you know, I've got my book. My husband has his thing. And my son is engrossed, you know, with his chessboard. And those are all fine. Those are good things. But on the other hand, I thought, you know, we need to connect. Mm -hmm. We need, these are all good things, but I think we're missing something. And I wanted us to connect. And so we did, and it was good. And we connected. And then, you know, later we went back to doing those things that we did. But, um, you know, those moments come up where I just feel like, okay, we need to do something different. Yeah. Do you encounter that yourself? I mean, everybody's happy, but something's missing. Yeah. Well, I always say that, you know, motherhood has like a very deep running river of guilt because it's easy to, you know, always feel like there's more because there is, right? There's never perfect is some weird thing out there that we're never actually going to experience. So I, you know, I think something that strikes me in terms of like the family dynamic in tapping into those points of connection are number one, where are like the rituals of connection? Do we have family dinner on a certain night? Do we have a family board game that we like to play? Is there a certain like question or conversation that's fun for us to have or touch base on? Um, And so using those types of things to like kind of keep the consistency of connection super valuable. But the other part of that where like there are those quieter moments or maybe it is a gross rainy day and actually what feels really delicious is to sit down and watch a movie together. I think something that always strikes me is how do we show up in any of those moments, whether they're for two minutes or two hours? How do we show up in them as present? Because that's when we actually feel the connection, right? Because I think there's for a lot of I'll just say for moms, I, I'm not a dad. I, I don't want to speak to the dad experience. But for a lot of moms, I think there's this pull of like, we always have to be doing more and we always could do more. And that's true. But like, is that more just happening and where our whole brain and self is like on the to-do list or it's at a, you know, on a conversation that happened at work today? And that is felt. And that's, I think, where we get in the kind of odd dynamic of like, I'm, I'm here and I'm with you, but I'm not, I don't feel connected because I'm not present here. And so I think, but again, whether it's two minutes or two hours, like how much of the time can I actually be listening to what you say, (laughs) present in my body and, and not actually somewhere else. And that feels when we're present a lot more connected and I'll, no matter what happens and our kids like they feel that all the way you know right when somebody's really listening to you or they're checking their watch or they're scrolling their phone like that doesn't feel like connection it feels like you're 
blowing by each other, like out in the breeze. So I think, you know, it's easy to underestimate, but presence alone is a huge connection point that's worth it, even if it's small. Absolutely. So what would you like uh, someone listening today to this podcast, what would you like them to do as a first step? As a first step, I would say if you're not feeling like you know your body and you're in your body, find somebody who can help you do that. Or if you have practices that you have historically liked and you can do, start there. How do you feel your muscles move? How do you feel your breath when it comes in and out of your body? Notice what happens to your mind when your body's in motion or, I mean, something as simple as stretching. It doesn't have to be like a 10 mile run. Like, you know, there's all sorts of the spectrum there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But part two of that is then invite the family into that. Because a lot of the connectivity of our family happens in play and presence. And our kids are the best at playing. And really, that's something that we can learn from them, them as our teacher, is that playfulness, the willing to be kind of like weird in the body, right? A kid will be doing like gymnastics off the couch and you're like, what on earth is happening? But if we could meet them in that playfulness and experience our own bodies in that way as well, it's like a two for one. We're, we're getting that movement. We're connecting to the sense of our body and connecting with the people that we love most. And it's just, it's easy. It's very accessible. And so I think that would be kind of like the number one place to start is in the body with, and then invite the kids in or your spouse in to experience that with you. You know, it's really funny you said that because that was what was missing for us that night. I Mm. said, you know, we're all in the separate parts of the room and I think we need to laugh. I think we need something. And I looked to my son and I said, hey, I know you have something. I know you have something that's silly and ridiculous. So out with it. (laughs) Then he didn't disappoint. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent and then um you know i have my favorite silly things from when i was growing up as did my husband and and that was what we needed that night so that's awesome that's pretty yeah what a beautiful way to connect yeah. yeah very cool so um cole thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about these things today that's a lot to think about and Usually the biggest truth and the biggest, greatest wisdom is usually something simple. Not always easy, but usually something simple. And you've given us a place to start simply so that we can begin to do this work. Awesome. I thank you so much for having me. It's fun to... Uh, No, I just, I think, um, I think the last thing I would say is back to that Mother Teresa quote. If you want to change the world, go home and love your family. And that to your point, happens in really small, like I'm here ways, not big, grandiose, got to change the world kind of vibes. And, you know, that that work, gosh, we need a lot of that. And I think those are the kind of connections and moments that literally will change the world. So, yeah, even if it's uh, seeing something that, you know, a kid did at, you know, with the sibling tonight, and you just want to recognize, hey, I saw that. That was a really kind gesture, right? Like there's just these super small, I'm here and I'm noticing, I'm willing to be present with you, ways that we share love and have our kids feel connected and like they're whole as they are. And that's, I think, you know, that's the stuff that is small but shifts everything. So to your point, yeah, it doesn't have to be big, but the work is worth it and a a whole bunch of really amazing stuff is available if you're willing to just give it a try and as I said get as weird as you want to get with it (laughs) love it and friends the links to Cole's website and her book and all of the fun things she does they're in the show notes so make sure you click on that and uh check it out and her website is called uh total potential yeah. So sounds like something that would be neat to have, right? Check it out. Yeah. Thanks, Cole. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. <laughs>